I didn't see you before. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon, friends and newcomers to the South Orange Library Special Conversations with Special People. Today, we have a very special person, Dr. Aronson. She has so many things that if I told you everything that she's involved with, it would take up the hour, but I'll just yeah, give you, you, you don't a have little to bit of clue. Number one, she's the founder of the Worldwide Orphans and this is from 1997 and what she has done to help orphans and children all over the world is amazing. She's on the faculty of Cornell Weill Medicine. She's the director of International Pediatric Health Services and consultant for Global Behavioral Health Net Network for children and young people. Obviously, she's a very busy lady and we're so fortunate that she came here today to, get, to donate her time here. Um, 10 years ago when she spoke here, um, it was 2010 and I was so, I was so impressed with what she was doing and the charity she was doing and um, she had a gala and my daughter Randy and I, we ended up going to help there and we went to Cipriani's which is probably the most fabulous place to hold this gala and Amy Poehler was there. She had famous celebrities are involved in her work and that's all due to um, Dr. Aronson. Um, today's topic, the world's orphan crisis, solutions and advocating for children, which is so important to, and more important than ever. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our very special guest. I won't waste any more time just to tell you I'm so delighted and an honor to have you here. So please let's give a very warm welcome to our very special guest, Dr. Jane Aronson. Hi everybody. Uh, I've been outside all morning uh, working um, on my terrace in the, the West Village. So I'm still uh, in my, in my um, outdoor, my scarf and my hat. Um, it's a very beautiful day. And um, I'm, you know, grateful that everyone has uh, uh, has joined us. Um, I see that there's 22 of us here. Uh, that's that's quite a group. And um, um, I just wanted to, um, I guess, I'll start by just uh, thanking uh, Phyllis for inviting me. I really do enjoy being in the community and having people know and understand. Uh, any kind of work, you know, it's a funny thing, any kind of work that people do, whether it's work with young children, older children, um, adults, uh, older adults, anything that is about kindness is really where I really feel the important emphasis on our time together today. That, you know, we all grow up learning to be polite and good citizens. But I think that some of us have a really wonderful gift early in our life. And I am have to, I really wanna to talk to you about the gift I got early in my life, which then led me to be on a path to really be a person about the community. My father's name is Harold. He was born in 1920 and was born in Brooklyn. And he was an extraordinarily sweet and lovely young man raised by a single parent. And there's a reason why I wanna talk about my father. And that's because we're in a pandemic and actually my father was born to a family. My grandma, Anna, and her husband, Barney, and Barney was a victim of the Spanish flu. So early in my life, I knew many things about what I would finally be, become. Barney had post-infectious encephalitis secondary to the flu pandemic. That is actually a, a, a very interesting disease, which we won't talk too much about but is depicted in a very beautiful book called The Awakenings. Um, and that book is a book I would recommend you all read. 
good read and also um, uh, it's a really wonderful movie with uh, Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. And it depicts in a hospital in the Bronx, the lives of those people who were infected with the virus during their early years in life and, and adulthood and who ended up with post-infectious encephalitis. And as a result, my father was actually raised by his mother mostly because my grandpa Bonnie, who I never met, um, died when my father was 10. He finally succumbed to the deterioration of his brain due to that pandemic. Uh, and that's the setting of, you know, the most, the importance in my life of history, the history of medicine, my family history. My father went on to be a, a wonderful student an athlete, uh, a Jewish boy in Brooklyn who was first string varsity in baseball, football, and basketball. And then went on to go to World War II to be in the army. And then the rest is history because my family came to be. When I was a little girl, my father had a store in South Jamaica, Queens, where I learned everything I needed to learn about charity. So let me just quickly talk about that a little bit. My, my dad was a man who really enjoyed people. He liked getting to know people. I was raised in the top of the store in, in South Jamaica for the first few years of my life. And I actually had a, a little, a, a wonderful nanny my mother worked with my father in the store and Emma, who was a beautiful, just full of life and energy, uh, African-American woman had a daughter Tootsie and really it was Tootsie who took care of me. And my early memories as a little girl living above the store were my care and, and the love that I received from Emma and Tootsie. And being in the store was very special. As I grew up, my father took me on house calls. My father was not a doctor. <laughs> he was a grocery store owner. He was a businessman and an athlete, but he took me to the homes of the people who lived in the neighborhood who came in the store. And we walked up the dark stairs and he pulled on the light that had no shade and the cockroaches scurried. And he held my hand and walked me up the stairs to sit with the family. And he had a little book, a little black book, spiral notebook, very small with tiny little rings and little pieces of paper with very thin spaces between and he used a pencil to list all the food that people bought. And he would come to visit with them when the welfare checks arrived. And he'd say, whatever you want to give me, <laughs> it's up to you. And I sat on his lap and I enjoyed meeting the families. And I played with the children. I had really a bunch of terrific friends in the neighborhood, Eugene and Sonny. I didn't even know that they were black. I used to look at their hands and I turned their hands over. We'd hold hands sometimes playing. I was very little and I'd wonder like, oh, isn't that funny? It's got the darkness on the outside and the lightness on the inside. That looks pretty cool. I wish I had that. What is that? And I had a very wonderful beginning in my life that led me to a destiny. And let me speak of the destiny. So my father taught me to ask questions, to be curious about the people he served in the community, in the neighborhood. He wanted to know them and so I wanted to know them. I wanted to know everybody. And then in my family was my great uncle Joe. 
who was the brother of my grandfather, Barney, who I never knew, but I knew Joe. Joe was an infectious diseases doctor who treated Native Americans, who we called Indians in those days, and he treated them for tuberculosis. He did beautiful research that still touted as some of the most exquisitely scientifically useful research on TB vaccine in the United States. He gave BCG vaccine to Native Americans to see if that would effectively diminish the scourge of tuberculosis in the Indian tribes across the plains of our nation. He carried an x-ray machine through snow drifts and he served thousands of Indians to help them have a better health, have a better health. Turned out that the BCG vaccine was not effective against tuberculosis in that way. And we removed it from our armamentarium of vaccines in those early years in the 30s. But interestingly enough, that vaccine has been incredibly important all over the world in preventing TB meningitis in young children. And in fact, now it comes into play because it, it clearly has an, an interesting effect on those who are exposed to coronavirus, who've been given BCG, appear to have less disease and less infectivity. So science is amazing that way, isn't it? That people can discover and learn about science that goes back hundreds of years. For instance, I'm sure you now, hope, hopefully you know, that vaccines are ancient history. They were always in our midst. People observed that if they were, if, if they were exposed to a disease that oftentimes they became immune or had very mild cases. Edward Jenner began really our serious history of vaccines in 1790s when he administered actually the cowpox to people and they then did not get smallpox, which was a devastating disease throughout history until the 70s. I think the last case of smallpox was in 1974. I'm having such fun. Is everybody okay? Yes, they're great, they're brilliant. <laughs> It's so much fun to talk about history, isn't it? And I have such an incredibly beautiful history. So when I grow up, you know, when I grew up, I wanted to be just like my great uncle Joe. And we visited my, my, my uncle Joe where he lived in Pennsylvania with his wife, Charlotte. And I just adored them. She fed me Lebanon bologna. They were living in the Amish country. <laughs> And I got to walk in the backyard. They had a lot of land and they had a well. This is my favorite part of the story. And I would walk with Joe. He wore corduroy pants with cuffs and moccasins and crisp white shirts and a bow tie. And he was, he had the most beautiful shock of white hair, like me. And we walked together. He held my little henty and took me out to the yard and we looked in the well. Boy, was that a scary well, <laughs> very scary for a little girl and lifted me up and allowed me to see that the well, could, the well would work by cranking up with a cord to bring that beautiful bucket of fresh cold water from way deep down. And he told me that my destiny and my dreams were in the well for me to discover deep in the well. If I looked hard enough at things, I would find my destiny. It's hard not to cry about it because it became the truth of my life. I was a little girl and I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to be a doctor who would treat people for infectious diseases. And 
also, I wanted to be someone who was adventurous about that work, that I would seek travel and I would learn about different cultures. And of course, I loved American Indians. And my mother <laughs> was crazy for Indians. And I learned that I could not root for the cowboys. I was rooting for the Indian. <laughs> and I had a wonderful experience. I had a, a dream to work on an Indian reservation and that came true for me in the early 90s. I went out to uh, Gallup, New Mexico and I worked for the Indian Health Service in um, Gallup for the Navajo. And I was fortunate enough during that time to really learn enormous amounts of, of uh, exciting, exciting infectious diseases issue, particularly one which was Merto Canyon fever. And that was, you know, a, a terrible moment. That was the Hanta virus that people were very frightened of and that was really quite a serious um, infection in the Indian population. Uh, and so that was again, a, a kind of an adventure for me to have that experience being out that way and actually seeing patients with Hanta. And in fact, I, was, I would have been at risk for it because on the weekends they had those Navajo rug sales where everyone, you know, hundreds of Native Americans would get together and they would auction off their rugs that they had made. And in the midst of that, there was no heat. There was just dust and dirt. The floors were dirt in, in the, uh, the Hogan's and the, the population was exposed to the Hanta virus in that environment. So moving right along, uh, that's a good beginning, isn't it girls? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, it's a good beginning. Yeah. And, and frankly, it led me to all the wonderful adventures that I had in my life, which was finally, I taught school for 10 years or more, and then I entered med school at the age of 31. But that was kind of unusual in my day. I kind of, uh, I had a circuitous pathway I had to have some adventures because being born in 1951 and growing up in the 60s was an extremely exciting time. And I needed to actually uh, sow my wild oats and learn about the world. So I was a bit of a hippie, and, uh, but I met my destiny and went off to med school in uh, 1982 at the age of 31. And the rest is history. I chose to be an infectious diseases doctor and was actually, uh, uh, again, serendipitously exposed to another great, incredibly great experience, but difficult and challenging and tragic. And that was the pandemic of HIV AIDS. And so that's where I went to medical school. I became a student of HIV AIDS and became a pediatric AIDS specialist. And it was incredible, incredibly amazing learning experience, deep, profound, and affecting my life, my sense of compassion and care for patients, my understanding of how a disease that has never be, been seen before could be studied and understood and conquered, which is what we're in the midst of now in the pandemic with coronavirus. And I've had my experiences. I've experienced SARS in 2003 and H1N1 swine flu in 2010, and now here in 2019, 2020, coronavirus. And this has been my world. I'm not a frontline responder, by the way. I'm 69 years old. And when this happened, there was no way that I was going to um, put myself in harm's way at that point. I have two sons who are still young, 20 and 22, responsibilities obviously in my life. Um, and, and I definitely didn't feel the need, though I was envious of being part of a force, of an incredibly heroic force of individuals, nurses and doctors and all kinds of healthcare workers. But I also knew that this virus was deadly and virulent, and I could not do that. So I have become obviously a, a student and devotee of, of the virus, and I love to study and go to classes and understand everything. But actually my, my destiny 
is in another direction. So infectious diseases are fantastic. They're exciting, they're challenging. I loved it. But the real challenge in life is really human behavior. That's the thing I love the best. And I've always been interested in how people feel and think and what happens to people who are traumatized or abandoned. And with that, I developed my interest in orphans and vulnerable children and created a foundation in the late 90s. And along the way there though, there was a really incredible mix of work which brought me to a place that it is, is sometimes very difficult for me to talk about. And that is the issues of children who are abandoned and then who are maybe fortunate enough to be adopted. So my career sort of organically flowed into this pathway where international adoption, domestic adoption grew enormously in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And I was fit acad academically to, to really handle the medical issues, the infectious diseases issues of children who lived in third world countries. And so I became very involved in that area. I developed a specialty in adoption medicine and that led me to travel to many countries where children lived in orphanages and institutions. And I got, I really decided at that point, I needed to learn that if a child came from a country where they were abandoned and brought up in an institution and had particular health issues, I wanted to know how did that happen? Where did it happen and how did it happen? And so I uh, started traveling to different countries, Russia and Ethiopia and Romania and Bulgaria. I mean, all over the world, China, Vietnam, and I learned what children look like and I understood how they became who they were so that when I could examine children who were being adopted, I understood a lot of the epidemiology of their medical issues. And then I understood the kinds of behaviors and emotions that they exhibited from their abandonment. And together it was an unbeatable combination. Not, not many people had that experience as I did. And then we were able to do service for children who lived in institutions. And we were part of deinstitutionalization in many countries where children were actually been able to be placed in forced care, kinship care, and or actually reintegrated or reunited with family, particularly HIV infected children. So I became a specialist actually in HIV infection in other countries. And many people actually chose to adopt children living with HIV. It was extraordinary. What great changes I experienced. The fear of HIV, the demonization of HIV, the politicization of HIV. And those years led to a better understanding but the social determinants of life are very powerful from a disease entity like HIV. Lots of stigma. And um, I feel very lucky to have been able to destigmatize those children. And, and many of them ended up in families and many of them ended up back in the families that had actually abandoned them. Pretty amazing story, actually, very dramatic. Hold on one second. Bring your snack. I see some lunch coming. <laughs> wow. Thanks. Um, so what about now? It's 125. I want to give you a chance to chat with me. I want to be chatting with you. So just to finish it up, there's a lot of stuff. I can't include it all. Um, I've written a lot. I've spoken a lot. I've shared a lot with people all over the world. I love Skype. I love WebEx, I love Zoom. I was Zooming before people even knew about Zoom because I needed to be in touch with the people who worked in those countries where we were doing service to help kids. 
We brought kids art, music, and dance, and theater, and writing, and sport, and camp. We had three camps for kids living with HIV in Ethiopia, Haiti, and Vietnam. Um, we partnered with hundreds of organizations, both pu public and private, and I entered into a world of global health and really understood the, the, the you know, the 30,000 foot, the perspective of what children face, orphan children. There are hundreds of millions of children living without parental care. Um, and I feel like at this point, my focus is their behavior and their emotions. Because the, really the issues for children who don't live with the guidance and love of an adult, they end up with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorder. Many end up with attention deficit disorder with and without hyperactivity, learning disabilities from malnutrition. There's lots of things that happen to kids when they don't have good health care and loving environments. But children are resilient and very hopeful in spite of all of that. And where I am now is I'm very focused on the identity and attachment issues of children exposed to those kinds of uh, devastating elements. And I'm very focused and always have been on helping parents to help their kids understand what their needs are as they grow up as adopted individuals. I love talking to adoptees. I really thrive on understanding the new ways we can think about identity and attachment when we haven't been able to really explore those ideas enough. We have a lot of judgments about how children live when they're not living with a family. There's lots of stigma but I'm feeling pretty excited these days about the opportunities to be able to take all of my life experiences, including the fact that I'm a parent through adoption and have two sons I mentioned who were adopted from Vietnam and Ethiopia. I feel like I'm really set at this age of mine to be able to really offer an amazing perspective and also new care models for young people who really are searching for their identity and dealing with the issues that they come with for sure. And that includes attachment issues. I'm gonna stop right now um, and just tell you, so I'm not retired, of course. I'm, I'm just not the retiring type. I'm a busy girl. I like to be busy. I like to be engaged. I love to be in touch with people. I am passionately in love with doing good. In fact, I gave grand rounds at NYU just a couple of weeks back and the title of my talk, talk was The Passion to Do Good. And you know, uh, when Phyllis got in touch with me, I thought this is the best, these are the best moments in my life to be with people like yourselves, to tell some stories and to be available to, to share with you. Uh, the, the, the wonderful adventures I've been able to experience and how uh, um, um, I think privileged. I've always felt privileged to have become a doctor and to be able to take that skill and to help children around the world. I feel like it's just like, it's like dizzying and dazzling. Questions, comments? Well, first of all, I have to say one thing. You didn't even say all the wonderful orphanages that you built all over the world. When we went and in Cipriani and we saw the happy children in their own environment. And um, it, it, was, it was amazing that you, you saw these, these people, the, the young volunteer workers there. Mm -hmm. and oh I, yeah, we had lots of volunteers, 412, I've lost count, but let me just say, say what, what, what Gladys is talking about, what Phyllis is talking about. I've just been, I, I've been on three Zooms this morning and um, the facilitator for the Zoom, new, Zoom one was, was Gladys Cohen. Anyway, so <laughs> back to Phyllis. Phyllis, we didn't build orphanages actually. We actually 
went and discovered orphanages in situ all over the world. And we brought them opportunities for enrichment. And we were part of helping the government and other private organizations to de to, in to deinstitutionalize, to get kids back in the community. And we did that through granny programs where we hired elderly people to come in and get trained and to, to uh, provide attachment for, for young toddlers. And we also provided toy libraries in many different countries, including the United States. We worked in uh, the Bronx, in Brooklyn, in downtown Manhattan, in um, uh, shelters for domestically abused women. And we created opportunities for children to play in curated toy libraries. So we were always about moving institutionalization to a place where it could disappear, if you will, rather than building orphanages. And in fact, um, that was uh, kind of something that we, we, we tried to convince people all over the world that wouldn't be a good thing to do. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Um, in that, I mean, I'm sure there are various reasons why there are growing or um, relatively large orphan populations in various countries. I would assume in China when they had population um, control measures regarding how many children uh, Chinese people or Ch Chinese couples could have, as well as in areas where they're war-torn and there's a lot of conflict, you tend to have parents who are either displaced or perhaps even um, killed as a result of war. Um, I guess issues where there's famine, lack of food, lack of resources is another source for um, a growing orphan population. So given that, I mean, there are orphans everywhere, I'm sure, and there may be larger populations in various areas, depending on what's going on in the socioeconomic environment and the political environment in those particular countries. Which countries do, quote unquote, orphan care the best? And how do they do that the best? And, and from the perspective of doing it the best, how many of them are really successful at getting orphans um, refamilied, you know, within their own countries and their own environments so that they are, you know, linked up with families and they actually have an opportunity to um, live a somewhat normal life as, as a child. That's quite a mouthful. Did you take a deep breath yet? I took many breaths. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't seem that way. Uh, I, 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 I don't see you actually. Are you kind of like cut off a little bit? Um, you, you would probably have to change the orientation of your Zoom screen to see me. I'm wearing a, I'm wearing a, a red fleece. Nah, I can't see that. I just I, I I wish I could see you. But you ask you you comment on a lot of things. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of orphans. We can't even count them anymore because it's very difficult difficult to to quantify and methodologically it's difficult. At one point in time, probably 25 years ago, the UNICEF gave us some data that there were 150 million children under the age of 18 who were living with a single parent and they were considered single or none. And those children were um, considered orphans. So the numbers are, are ridiculous. Um, uh, the idea though that about what services are best and which countries do it best, that's a really interesting question. First of all, orphanages are no good. They're not places for anybody um, who wants that, you know, I mean, you just can't raise a child in an orphanage. There's no such thing as a good orphanage. And people can never convince me that because I went to, you know, literally probably hundreds of orphanages in my time in many different places with well-meaning people. So I don't have negative feelings. I don't like, I'm not angry about it, but I, I can just tell you there's lots of studies to show that orphanage, Orphanages are just not good places for children. It's a crowded environment. There's a, a lack of, uh, it, it, you know, the kind of individualized care that's necessary for children to attach, and there's not the kind of good nutrition that you that you need, and it's just the socialization that is completely devoid of of, of humanity. So we got rid of orphanages in the 50s and 60s, and we replaced it with foster care but we didn't really even do a terrific job there. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully over time, you know, we've improved some of ideas about how to help reconstitute 
families that are um, dysfunctional for whatever the reasons. But, uh, you know, when I started in the business many years ago, there were 50,000 foster care kids in New York. Now there's about 8,000. That's pretty amazing, but it took forever, decades and decades to change that. Um, so, but other things you mentioned about like, where's the best place maybe to take care of orphans uh, and vulnerable children at risk kids? Actually, there are circumstances that are interesting. That's an interesting question. And I used to take that question and I would handle it, especially if parents were coming to see me about adoption, whether it was Guatemala or Latin America or China or Asia, South Asia, India, um, Africa, Ethiopia, South Africa, um, wherever it was, I, I did have a sense from my travel and my work that there were you know, some kindnesses though generally the care was poor. Uh, there were moments of kindness for sure. But I'd say to you the in most interesting thing I'm gonna say is about Korea. South Korea had an extraordinary and still has an extraordinary forced to care system. It's pretty authentic, it's real. And the culture of Korea leads me to believe that it's real because there's a real commitment to this transitional period of children born to women who might not be married, casual alliances, and the babies are born, there's prenatal care a little bit, women can deliver their babies appropriately with good health care, and then the babies are placed immediately in forced to care with trained families. And it's been my experience having been involved with really hundreds of Korean adoptions over the years that that is the standard of care in situations where children end up abandoned. They do a really great job of setting the child up, but there's, you know, minus is there too. The children stay. Now they stay a little longer because the Kore Korean government had tried to convince Korean citizens to take children and adopt them themselves. That's a tall order for Koreans. And the, the children are then adopted as toddlers and not infants as they used to be. So then you have a toddler who's been uh, living very nice life in a foster home in Korea and then has to go and live with some white people in, uh, you know, in South Orange <laughs> and, and learn how to speak English after being really speaking pretty good Korean. So, and I deal with a lot of that. That's really tough stuff. There's a lot of transitional issues in that system because they don't get the kids out younger anymore. The issue with Koreans not wanting or any na country nationals not wanting a child has to do with very old and in, in, in ingrained kind of thinking that a child who's been abandoned somehow is a bad seed. And that taking that stranger into your house becomes very challenging. And in fact, in many African countries where there's actually government mandates to have families take children in, um, like um, in Rwanda after the genocide, those children have no rights. They get taken in and they're tolerated and they're given education, but they have no rights to the, they don't have a right to the name of the family. They're not really adopted in the way that really would be, I think, provide permanency. And they end up not being able to inherit property or be really a true member of the family. So there's a lot of cultural <laughs> craziness around the world around the issue of taking in children who lost their families, as you noted, through war and disease and natural disasters um, and pandemics. Don't you think to, to a certain extent that here in the United States, we have a um, aversion to adoption with a, with a similar sense of, gee, you know, this is an unwanted child and not really knowing the history of the parents or the medical history necessarily 
that we have an aversion to adopting children because they're not quote unquote our children. Yeah, I think that's an old idea, but I think that, you know, I, in my career, I've, I've you know, I've experienced, you know, there's well over 200,000 children who've been adopted from South Korea since the Korean conflict. No, but I mean, I mean, for, for United States citizens to adopt children in the United States. Oh, you, I mean, you're we, talking we about have, domestic, excuse me, you're talking about domestic adoption? Yeah, yeah, domestic adoption. I mean, we, we adopt a lot of children from other countries. We don't oh, adopt no, no. as many. We, we, we adopt a lot of domestic children as well. But the problem with domestic adoption is, as you say, there, there is definitely an, a, a feeling, unfortunately, where people, many things. First of all, the person who is adopting may feel very um, much like a second class citizen because they couldn't achieve fertility. And even if they tried reproductive uh, technology, which now is really less expensive and very successful, people you know, are then put in this position of feeling as if they didn't, they weren't successful at being able to have their own kids. And that's that, that own kids. And then they're adopting children who come from families that, you know, of late, the data is just extraordinarily disturbing and that 4 million children born every year in the United States and thousands of kids are born to mothers who use drugs or alcohol during the pregnancy. Every 15 minutes, a baby is born in the US who's been exposed to substances during the pregnancy. Now, all that said, let me lighten up the, uh, the prognosis here and say that the vast majority of people who choose to adopt children do very well. They, are, they have education, there's a, a lot of counseling that's provided and lots of people really uh, enjoy and love and are passionate about the process of adoption. And there's lots of support for that and there's lots of success uh, for both domestic and international adoption. So, you know, there's good news on that score. And also there's more now about open adoption so that people are in touch with the, the birth family and there's a sharing of that information. Lots of states have opened up their, uh, their, uh, their closed uh, legal systems around adoption. So there's a lot of changes and there's a lot of growth and maturity about how we look at uh, and, and, and try to lessen the stigma attached. But it's not easy. It's a complicated issue and adoptees definitely are unique, unique in some very special ways. I always used to tell my kids, you have to have a sense of humor around this, that they're lucky not to look like me. And we would laugh and have, we would enjoy that we were a, you know, a mixed race family and that we were a good family, a devoted and caring family. And, um, but yet we understood clearly that our, um, the children who we adopted are, you know, definitely have unique issues around their identity. And that becomes really something that is very unusual for the rest of an adoptee's life. The kinds of questions one asks, who am I? Who were my parents? And you know, lots of people do search, but and not lots of people don't. Um, there's no, uh, I think, hard and fast rules that search is best. It's really up to the individual. But more and more people, <clears throat> even international uh, adoptions, lots of adoptees really enjoy going back to their countries, learning about their countries, finding vestiges of where they might have been and even locating family, interestingly enough. I have a question. My husband keeps asking about what happened in Texas, McAllen, Texas. What do we do about the children that were taken away from their parents and their parents can't find over 500 of them? Yeah, I have no answers for you there, but I'm glad you brought it up because I think the, the border children is a disaster. And, um, uh, you know, that's just, that's absolutely diabolical in my, in my, in my opinion. I just, I'm going to be a straight shooter and tell you that what's been done there is um, absolutely tragic and violent. It's violent. All of us in pediatrics who understand about abuse of children 
that's a violent act that occurred. Uh, that children should never be part of politics. They should never be caught in situations like that. That's just completely immoral. And, um, and there's lots of people working very hard, both lawyers and child advocates <clears throat> who have really dedicated themselves to border issues. Uh, I'm not uh, you know, necessarily privy to all of it, though I attend meetings and I'm, I'm uh, aware of all of the issues and I can speak to them. This, especially as it pertains to attachment issues, it's devastating and inhumane. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to be an American that we would have done such mm. horrific things to children mm. and families under those circumstances. Other questions, comments? I, yes, go ahead. Um, I was actually going to ask the question that Phyllis did, but I'm just gonna ask you a follow-up. What do you think is the long-term effect of the situation at the border on those children? Um, if well, I think I referred to it, and I'll, I'll, uh, but I'll go over a little bit more. Those are children who, who really have experienced uh, violence and abuse. And so those are kids that have post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorder, and many other emotional and psychological, complex psychological issues, particularly attachment disorder. They've lost their families. Right. And um, they've been robbed of their sense of uh, security and attachment. And secure attachment is the most important part of early life for a human being and even for many uh, creatures, uh, mammals, primates. Right. Uh, secure attachment makes us healthy and helps us to grow and be content and be successful in our communities. And so most of the kids who... Uh, suffered these uh, abuses in the border, uh, on the border, uh, those are kids who have really serious issues with attachment and will need long-term treatment. Hopefully at some point soon, they'll, get, they'll ha have the ability to get treatment. Thank you. What would you well, say is, is the um, barrier that domestically we face and, and the percentages as well of children in the foster care system actually being adopted, because these I'm, I'm assuming can be older children and not infants. People typically want to adopt infants, not necessarily children who are older. You know, what, what, what's the proclivity for adoption of older children? And, um, and even in the foster care system with them staying with the family over a long term. So there is some sense of stability in their lives. Well, the, the, you know, foster care has really changed a lot. There's been a lot of progress. <clears throat> so the numbers are, you know, have been really diminished in, in cities all over the country. There's still 400,000 children in the United States in foster care, but it's changed. There's lots of changes with the, the view and perspective of what's necessary to help children be healthy and thrive. And that's, of course, the goal being permanency. So I think the, the old days of kids going from one home to the next, to the next, to the next, that's changed rapidly and, and radically over the years. It still exists in some places where there's uh, inopportunity and poverty. But generally speaking, things have improved. Um, and older children have certainly been a very focused group uh, it is really important that we get the word out that older children are a good bet and a good investment, if you will, and that they do well when they're brought into a family, a loving family that's committed to them. It's not easy though, because older kids have lots of complex, uh, but mostly co complex educational and psychological issues that need to be attended to. And so they often may need special education, but it's available. It's part of our, our system to have early, invent, early intervention in the first three years of life. And then thereafter we have special education through the school departments of education. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm definitely feeling as if there's more optimism in the world regarding the adoption of older children, particular, particularly diverse children. Um, and, um, but, you know, we're far from 
the gold standard of making sure that kids have permanency early on. I work in Australia. I'd like to mention that I'm a, a global health and behavioral uh, expert and I've had a lot of training through my work for the foundation. And um, I've always enjoyed working in partnership with different kinds of uh, country structures. So Australia has a very unusual situation. They, they, uh, uh, they did some stuff that was really pretty damaging to their indigenous people. Like every country, there are indigenous people. And in Australia, they have the Aboriginal indigenous people who uh, Australians in the, in the last century decided weren't capable of taking care of their own children, just like we did when we took Indian children away from their families and put them in um, these uh, boarding schools, if you will, which were orphanages and places of horror and hell. And lots of people were harmed in the same way that indigenous people in Australia were harmed. Now, 4% of the population in a country like Australia, which is only 25 million people, let's say, live there, are indigenous. And the vast majority of any children living in out-of-home care in Australia are indigenous. And they live with either grandparents or aunts, uncles, or volunteer kin people who are also supported in some way from budget. But they have a, uh, a system where there's 50,000 in uh, children living in foster care. They call it out of home care in Australia. And I'm uh, on their advisory board, uh, Adopt Change, uh, to be able to mentor and build capacity for the carers. So I work weekly on sessions and then I do a lot of uh, strategy work to improve the caring system, which is carers, people who may be related or not related, and who then take uh, a very serious view of developing good care for the children, like a family, like permanent, but they're not allowed to be adopted. There's some guardianship and very little adoption. And that's because when all those children were removed from their Aboriginal homes and brought up by white people, um, that was a disaster. <clears throat> what a crime, crime of the century that was. And that's referred to as the lost generation. And in, in order to avoid in, uh, having that happen again, the government of Australia has decided not to make adoption and permanency their goal. There's plenty supportive of foster care and creating families with family members and with those who get trained in the population. But there's so much to learn. There's a lot to learn there. I mean, I take care of a lot of complex issues on the Zoom. Uh, we're trying to build capacity for the carers and perhaps change the government's attitude so that there's more guardianship, at least, because kids need permanency. But just as an example, you know, who would have thought, right? Who would have thunk that that's the kind of thing that happens? But that's the kind of thing that happens all over the world. Wow. Who places... Who places these for, uh, these foster children in America and all over the world? They have a DIFUS or is it? Uh, yeah, they have divisions of, they have social welfare uh, infrastructures. Every country has a social welfare infrastructure. Yeah. And they operate similarly. There are social workers, there are administrative people, there are psychologists, there are teachers, there are psychiatrists who are associated with the system. Children get it evaluated and uh, there's home visits. Australia is very interesting because they're very devoted to, to uh, maintaining the relationship with the birth family. It's pretty extraordinary. I really love it. Um, I have, as an example, I had a grandmother who like overnight became the parent to a two-year-old, her grandson, because her daughter was not capable of taking care of the child anymore. And so the grandmother was called by the social welfare people and they said, can you come and pick this little boy up? And she said, yeah, sure. And so she picked him up and now she's parenting him. But uh, just more recently, there's such a commitment to being in touch and integrating both kinds of carers, if you will, birth carers and out of home carers that they, uh, this particular woman drove five and a half hours each way 
to visit with her daughter and have her son be with his birth mother for a good week and they're gonna go back during the holiday. That's a really successful moment. Lots of anger and lots of antipathy and lots of really complicated issues for sure. But what a wonderful thing to really see that maintaining the birth family, even though the, the birth mother is uh, likely a drug addict or, or an alcoholic or both, that the child still gets to be connected to the birth mother and then has grandmother. Uh, so it's a, a fascinating new world. And um, I think it's a good thing, this business of really trying to conserve birth connection. I really do. Time will tell. Other questions, comments? So how, how much data do we collect um, on children ra raised in the foster care system? Oh, we're collecting, we're collecting data all over the place. It's, yeah, it's and, and how they actually and how they actually fare as adults in their adult lives, and we how have, what kind of parents they actually become as well. I, I'm going to just generalize and tell you there's huge amounts of research that goes on in the United States following uh, foster kids uh, in their in their foster homes and in for especially for foster kids who become permanent and are adopted. And um, the prognosis has really improved, as I said before, it's improved markedly because we get kids out sooner and the placements are, uh, are better. And uh, there's less kids, less kids in forced to care, more kids returned and reunited or reintegrated with birth family. And more, more um, um, integration of the kinds of complex therapeutic um, interventions that are so necessary, which involves education and, and behavioral care. That's the place where I love to be, really helping kids with their identity issues and attachment, education, and helping them to change the trajectory of what we call the, you know, the sort of trans, there's a, a kind of inheritance, if you will, from generation to generation, things have stayed the same so long and now there's a breaking of that cycle, stopping that um, and moving to a new life so that foster care kids uh, will grow up, have good relationships and deal with their identity and their attachment issues and can be successful human beings. So we've come a long way. Well, you are amazing. And when you said that to be kind, well, your family taught you the best rule in the world, and you have helped so many people. And well, thank you so much for having me. I just, pleasure. You are it's wonderful. Been a great, it's great being with you. I, I have another meeting with actually a psychiatrist who we're going to do some work together to help with kids in the city who need help with their identities and their um, and all of that good stuff. So happy holiday to everybody. Um, I hope I see you again, not 10 years later. We right. can, let's, we can let's figure out different things to talk about. Be well and safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, ciao.